Okay, so we just introduced the idea of model combination methods. Now let's go over two of the most simple but effective methods uh, for model combination, namely bootstrapping and feature bagging. And I'll justify these approaches from a viewpoint of reducing the variance in the bias variance decomposition of the expected error. Okay, so here we are in the, the overview, right? So we just introduced the idea of model combination methods and put it in contrast uh, to what we already saw, namely Bayesian model averaging. And now I'm going to explicitly show some methods to form these uh, committees, namely via uh, bootstrap aggregation and via the random subspace method. Okay, so essentially the simplest way to construct a committee is simply by training several models and then uh, let my uh, eventual prediction be the average over these models. But then of course I need ways to, to train these different models. And one way of training different models is simply by picking different data sets. And for every new data set, I'm going to train a new model. And that was essentially what we did when we talked about the bias variance uh, uh, trade-off. So what we did in the bias variance uh, decomposition video, we, we, we talked about the data set being a random variable in itself, right? So I can have this process that generates new data sets. So, and every time I observe a data set, I can train a model and this model has a certain performance. And then if I make a new data set observation, train my model again, my model performs slightly different. So I can talk about an expected error that my model is going to make given all these over and over newly sampled uh, data sets. And then we saw that this error decomposes in a bias, which essentially explains the difference between each of these trained models and the ground, fu ground truth function that needs to be predicted. So the bias essentially characterizes how well my model would be uh, able in modeling this ground truth function. I mean, if I have a very simple model, then I probably have a large bias because my models will be different from what my true very complicated model is, is going to be. Uh, but then this, is, this was balanced against a variance term, right? And this variance represents the sensitivity of a model to the individual data points that it was uh, trained on. So if I train a model on an observed data set and then I train it again on a different data set, then these models, they can look completely different. And if they uh, look completely different every time I train them, we say there's a high variance in, in my model, right? And now in the ideal setting, we want that both the bias and the variance is going to be uh, low. We want uh, my model to become a good approximation of my ground truth, but I also want that every model will be uh, uh, similar. So I don't make errors because my data set was just slightly different than the way it was before. So what we're going to do next, we're going to talk about constructing committees by taking this uh, bias variance decomposition uh, into account. And to do so, let's take a recap of this bias variance decomposition example. So the example is as follows, so, uh, right? So I'm going to generate L data sets, let's say 100 data sets uh, consisting of 25 points. And each data set is generated as follows. So I'm just going to uniformly sample a point on the, the x-axis. So actually, I'm going to uniformly sample 25 points on the x-axis. And then I'm going to pull them through this uh, sine function. So this is actually going to be my ground truth function that I want to approximate. It's given here in green. So green is the function that we're approximating. And so we're randomly sampling points on this sine plus some noise. So we have some epsilon noise uh, to each uh, measurement. Okay, and then the experiment is as follows. So we have L of these uh, data sets and we're going to fit a linear uh, regression model to this uh, using Gaussian basis functions. It's just a choice, but, so, but we use 24 Gaussian basis functions and know that we only have 25 uh, points per, per data set. So this is a really, this is really a flexible uh, model, right? So, so it can actually quite easily overfit on, on these data sets. And then in order to control uh, the complexity of these models, so they are intri intrinsically complex, they can represent all sorts of functions, but really the complexity is going to be controlled via this uh, rich regression penalty, right? So we're going to put a penalty on the size of the weights. And when lambda becomes very large, I do not allow my weights to take on high values. And when they become very small, then basically it means I have no uh, penalty at all. And I can get very uh, noisy uh, models that, that overfit essentially. And that's what you see in these figures, right? So if lambda is indeed very high, then I put a large penalty on W. And then I actually see that my models, they're sort of damped, uh, right? So um, 
if I take the expectation over these models, I compute the average model that's depicted uh, on the right over here, we see actually a large bias, right? So we see that the average model is completely different uh, from my ground truth model. So that's the idea of uh, the bias that the expectation of my data sets of my models trained on each of these data sets, if that is a very much different from my uh, ground truth, then I say I have a high bias. But the good thing is that uh, I have low uh, variability among models, right? So I have uh, low variance. And so, and then we saw that, that we have a trade-off between the two, right? So and now if I have a very flexible model, then maybe each individual model is kind of noisy, but you see it nicely follows the overall structure of my f function. So if I take the average, so that's uh, the red curve over here, it's super close to my ground truth. So we see that these very complex models, they tend to have a low bias. So they tend to approximate my true signal well on average. But individually, you see a lot of variance between the models. So um, against low bias, we see actually high variance. Okay, this is something we already saw, right? That we have this trade-off between uh, variance and bias. And ideally, you want to have uh, both of them low. You want to have reliable models that are the same every time, that are not too dependent on a particular data set that they observe. But of course, I also want these models to be accurate, so I also want a, a low bias. And now what this example really shows, now suppose I have all these data sets and all these trained models, but then I can just average them, right? And that leads to a very low bias, even when my models are very complex. So what we see that averaging these models, that, that really only works when I work with models that already have a, a low bias to start with, but which have a high variance, because if I average over this, I essentially reduce the variance. And in this low bias example, or sorry, high bias example with low variance, if I average, uh, yeah, I get slightly better results. So I really reduce the variance to, to, to zero because I'm considering only one model, but my bias remains high. So model averaging is a good thing uh, because it reduces uh, variance, but it cannot really increase, uh, sorry, reduce the bias as well. And that's going to be the main idea behind committees to work with uh, flexible models that have a low bias and then we're going to use this idea of model averaging to really reduce uh, the variance. Okay, that's again some right over here, right? So when we average models trained on different data set, the contribution of the variance reduces. And so when we average a set of low bias models, so those are very complex methods, right? So they have low bias but they have high variance, we actually obtain in the end very accurate predictions. So. Uh, the average of all these complex models reduces results in a quite stable uh, prediction in the end. But then we're also back to the problem that we discussed before, that in practice we only have one single data set, right? So it's, it's weird to split your single data set into these small parts to come up with very poor models such that you can average them afterwards. It's still better to just use the entire data set. So what we can do, we can now apply a trick to artificially create new data set out of the data set I, uh, that I already have. And that is going to be done via the bootstrap method. So we're going to introduce variability between uh, different models by uh, messing with my data set, essentially creating new data set. We're uh, bootstrapping the data set. And the idea is as follows. So, so I have this entire data set of observations. I have N of such uh, data points. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to create B new uh, data set. So capital B represents the number of new data sets that I'm going to generate. And each individual data set is going to be of the same size of my original data set. So each, so each XB is a new data set of size N. And these data sets are going to be generated by randomly sampling N points out of my original data set with replacements. And this means that some data points will occur multiple times in this particular data set XP. And it can also happen that some points will never be sampled. And then the reason for this uh, sampling with replacement is that, I mean, if I do not do this, then basically my new, new data set will be just a shuffled version of my original data set. So it does, it, in that sense, it isn't different from my original data set. Whereas I do sampling with replacement, then maybe some points uh, are sampled more often and some points do not occur in this particular data set, but they do uh, get included in, in, the, in one of the other data sets. So with this random uh, sampling with replacements, I really generate 
data sets that are different from one another. Obviously, there will be overlap between uh, some of these distributions, but in general, they will be different. Okay, so this is a very uh, simple idea to generate new uh, data sets. So then we have all these uh, capital B number of, of data sets, and then we can train a model on each of these data sets. So the model trained on data set X uh, index B uh, is going to be denoted with Y index with uh, a small b. Okay, so now I have obtained a committee of predictive models YB. And then my final prediction can, for example, simply be done by taking the average over all my predictions. Now, this approach is what you call a bootstrap aggregation or bagging, where I must warn actually that this term bagging will also later be used in a different context, namely feature bagging. So when someone talks about I'm using a bagging to generate a new data sets, then really you should ask, okay, what do you mean? Do you mean uh, like bootstrap aggregation, like generating new data set, or do you mean feature bagging? And that's something that we're going to discuss uh, next actually. Okay, what we're going to do next, we're going to think about what this way of constructing committees does to our bias variance uh, decomposition. So I just said that we want to reduce the variance and now uh, we're going to think about if this actually happens, if, if I do this, this form of, of uh, model combination. So what we're going to do, we're going to suppose that we know uh, our ground truth uh, h of x. Then we can say that each of my models uh, makes a particular error, right? So, and the error is basically the difference between my model and my ground truth. So the main point to take into account here is that each model has its own uh, errors for each x. So then we can also think about what the overall error of my single model is going to be, right? If I average out over x. So if all these x's and uh, at each point x I made a particular error. So let's take a look at uh, the mean of my squared error over my all x's. So that's given as follows, right? Then I have all these different models indexed with a small b and I'm just going to compute the average error that, that all of these models make. So that's indicated with e subscript uh, av. So the average error of my uh, individual models and that's going to be given by 1 over b times the sum over uh, the mean squared error. So now we're going to compare this average error of all these single models compared uh, to the, the error, the expected error that my committee is uh, supposed to make. And my committee was given by the error of these predictions. So uh, my committee model just spits out one number, right? And it's going to be a combination of all these individual predictions. Then similarly for the committee, I can compute this uh, expected error by taking uh, the average over all my predictions uh, x, right? Because this is my uh, committee model, y committee. And I can take my uh, ground truth inside the sum, right? Via this uh, trivial relation, h of x simply given by 1 over b sum over uh, b h of x. So that allows me to put it in, in this form. So uh, the expected error of my committee is going to be given by uh, the square over the average error and then average over uh, my positions x. So that's different than, than here, right? So here I compute like my mean squared error and then I'm averaging it. And here in this particular case, I first compute uh, the mean of the error, then squared and then average it. Okay, now let's make this relation between the average error and the committee error a bit more explicit by doing the following. So what we can do, we can assume that the expected error uh, at each data point and of each model is going to be zero. And I think this is a reasonable assumption, right? So sometimes uh, my model is slightly above that ground truth, sometimes below, but on average it's, it has zero error, error. Then I'm going to make a different assumption, namely I'm going to assume that the errors between models is uncorrelated. Now this is a somewhat um, debatable assumption, right? Because I can certainly assume that my models are going to be correlated uh, via this bootstrapping uh, method. But for now, let's just, uh, let's just assume that each model is independent from one another and therefore also the errors are uncorrelated. Then what we have that uh, since my covariance uh, between these models is zero, and uh, the average of each of these errors is also going to be zero, then this implies that the expectation over the product of these errors is zero, right? That follows from the definition of the covariance, right? Which is given by the expectation of the product of these two random variables minus uh, the product of the expectation. So really these two together imply that also the, 
the expectation of the product of these two random errors is going to be a zero. Then if you write this out, you can show that my uh, committee error is going to be given by one over B uh, times my average error. So it seems that it's really advantageous to work with multiple committees, B of them, because with every committee member, I decrease my, my total error by quite a bit. And if you want to verify this, uh, maybe we can quickly do this. So I'm computing the expectation of uh, this thing squared. So that's the expectation of one over B squared. Then well, one times this sum. So over B is one to B, the error B. So we're squaring this thing, right? So and now times the product of the sum. Now I have to use a different index, B prime, the error B prime at X. Okay, the expectation of this thing. Okay, so let's write this out. So linearity says that I can take the one over B squared out. I can take these sums out. B is one to B, B prime is one to B, and then the expectation of the product of this uh, beat error times the product of the B primed error. And our assumption was that uh, these are uncorrelated errors. So that means that the expectation of B and B prime is going to be zero in general, but only when B is exactly B prime. So when we're considering the same models, yeah, then we can uh, have some uh, non-zero uh, expectation. So I'm going to put this direct delta here saying that uh, this is only one if B equals B prime, because if B is not equal to B prime, so if I consider different uh, models, then there's no correlation between these errors and thus these components uh, evaluate to zero. So this tells me that I can get rid of one of these sums, right? Because the only components that remain in the sum are the cases where B equals uh, B prime. So let's write that out. So then we see that we have one over B squared, the sum over all my models, and then the expectation of uh, my error for model B squared. And that's what we see over here, right? So we see that uh, this is the same as one over B times my average error. Okay, so this explains this uh, particular step. And it says that if I assume that my models are uncorrelated and hence I can assume that their errors are uncorrelated, then I can uh, gain a huge reduction in uh, these, these average errors by a factor one over B. And that's the key point here. If I have independent models, I really gain a lot of uh, reduction in errors. Okay, so that's again summarized over here. If I uh, assume independence uh, across my models, then my committee error is going to be redu reducing the average error by a factor one over B. So it's very advantageous to work in such a committee uh, method, but we obviously made this very strong assumption that the individual models are uncorrelated. And this in practice is of course definitely not the case especially when uh, we bootstrap the data set, right? Because um, some of the same points uh, recur in all the different data sets. So there is definitely going to be a correlation among my uh, bootstrap data sets. Okay, but the good thing is, and you can actually show this, and I'm not going to show this in this video, uh, but trust me on this. If you uh, take a look at the expected error of such a committee method, it will always be equal or smaller than uh, the errors, the average error of my individual models. So this really means it will never get worse. You'll never make it worse by uh, using such bootstrap method. Uh, but it's just that maybe you require to do some more computations. Okay, but we just saw that if my errors are uncorrelated, so if I have uh, uncorrelated data sets, for example, then I have this really clear improvement. So the strategy would be what you want to aim for is to generate data sets which are uncorrelated. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the, in the next slide. But the general recipe is we are going to build B models which have a low bias. So that means we have complex models that are capable of overfitting. And then we're going to train a bunch of them and we average them. And this will eventually reduce, uh, reduce uh, this variance in my predictions. Okay, and then this works on the, the notion that uh, in this bootstrapping, my data sets will look uh, different every time, right? So I sample them uh, with replacement. So each of these individual data sets look different. So they're not 
fully correlated, but they are somewhat independent. So it will reduce uh, my variance in the end. And now let's go over a different way of uh, reducing uh, the dependency between data sets. And we do this by sampling subsets of the features. So I'm not sampling different points in each data set, but I'm choosing to focus on only um, particular features in my uh, vectors that consist of my, uh, or that comprise my data set. And with that, I mean, I have this whole data set of samples. These vectors X each have their own feature values, right? So feature value one, feature value two, uh, etc. So all my feature vectors are vectors of uh, length D. And what I'm going to do, I'm now going to only use a couple of them. Let's say uh, I set R to three, which means I'm only going to pick three of such uh, feature values. And that is going to be forming the feature vector that I'm going to use in my model. So with these three values uh, for each data point, I'm going to train uh, model one, for example. Uh, then maybe I'm in a second run, I'm only going to use these particular values, let's say the first three values, and that is going to be used to train a different model, let's say uh, model Y2. And then of course I can repeat this for several subsamplings of my feature vector. So maybe in another run, I'm only going to use X3, X4 and X5, and that is going to give me in the end my trained model uh, Y3. Okay, so instead of randomly sampling my data points, I'm going to randomly sample uh, the features that I'm going to use to train my model. So this is called uh, random, the random subspace method. And this works particularly well if my features are uncorrelated, right? Because we want to work with uncorrelated data sets, because then we can most effectively uh, reduce uh, the error that my committee is going to make. And you can imagine that uh, this causes the learners not to overfocus on features that are overly predictive for the training set, but that do not generalize well to new data set, right? Suppose this X1 feature is super uh, descriptive uh, for my training set for some reason, but then I have a test set where this doesn't play a role. Yeah, then I have a model that isn't working properly. So whereas in the training phase, my model learned to rely a lot on this particular fe feature. But then if I consider a different model, for example, Y3, then this feature isn't used and this model uh, learned to make predictions without this particular model. So uh, that sense, by randomly shuffling my input features and train different models, we, can, we gain more robustness against this, this particular type of overfitting. So, and yeah, and so feature backing also works particularly well if the number of features is much larger than the number of training points, because if this would be the case, then my model in itself using all these feature values could maybe re really memorize the training set in itself. And this is not going to happen if you just use a random subset of my feature vectors. And then of course we can decide to combine bootstrapping with random subspace methods, right? To really reduce the dependency between the, mod uh, the data sets on which my models are trained. And if you use this combination of bootstrapping and random subspace methods with a very simple uh, classification method called decision trees, then what you obtain are random forests. And that's going to be explained in, in uh, the last video of this uh, lecture.